Hello there, and welcome back to Declassify for another week of questions and conversation. This episode, I'd like to welcome a voice that some of you might be familiar with, and that voice belongs to Stephen Adams. Stephen has been working for ABC Classic FM since 2004, specialising in the broadcasting, programming, as well as production of Australian music and of new music. He's also a well-known composer and performer, and I'm so glad that he's joining us this episode. I'd like to welcome Stephen onto the podcast. Hey, Stephen. Hi, Vicky. Uh, great to be here. Well, thanks for coming along for the ride. And as I said in the little intro, you're both an experienced musician and a performer, aside from your work in the ABC. So I thought it'd be a really good place to start for you to give us an understanding of your background and how all of that relates to your experience of new music through actually creating it. Well, yeah, I'm, I was... I only became a radio and media person at the age of 40. So <laughs> for the previous uh, 30 years or so, I made music myself and, and recorded quite a lot of it, uh, But I and recorded some other people's as well. But it wasn't actually part of my grand plan to, for life to become a radio producer. It's one of those kind of things, accidents that happened. And so it changed my view of how careers unfold and lives unfold to realize that something like that could happen, which was not at all what I was aiming for or thinking about. So, sorry, that was a slightly circuitous answer, but coming back to the, the main nub of your question, I think I've always made music since I was a very small child, but the idea of new music, whatever that, the idea of new music as a category of culture, I guess, is something that kind of crept up on me in my mid-late teens sort of introduced to some living composers at some point, some point in my high school years. And I had my own band and I was also involved in drama and was make, writing music for these children's pantomimes and things. And then at a certain point, I had this opportunity to uh, put in for this school composers workshop and I got to write this piece of music for these four musicians, members of a group called the Seymour Group. Uh, this is back in 1981. They were quite important in Sydney through the 70s and 80s and really into the 90s as, and even into the early 2000s as um, champions of new music and chamber music. And through this experience and meeting Anne Boyd in person and Nigel Butley in person and Trevor Pierce and um, Richard Toop, all of these people, there's suddenly this kind of world exploded. And I went, oh, this is all happening now. Somehow that became something that I uh, gravitated towards, although I was still very attached to playing in bands and all sorts of other musical activities that didn't quite fit into that cultural world. How does it affect what I do now or where, I've, where I'm doing in radio? That's a really hard question to answer. I mean, the, the short answer to that is that I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now in radio if I hadn't been writing music and playing music for most of my life. So I came into radio sideways in a role that was called Australian Music Curator at the time. It was a one-year contract. It was a one-off idea of the guy who was head of ABC Classic back then in 2004. And it was the idea to get someone in from outside the ABC who was involved in a grassroots way in contemporary art music to try and cook up some initiatives and do some things for a year. Actually, the brief was amazingly either vague or sweeping, depending on how you like to look at it. The network had just axed six months earlier two really significant programs, which I and lots of other people were unhappy about. <laughs> They'd axed a thing called The Listening Room, which had been hugely important to uh, the development of radiophonic art and sound art in Australia. And they'd also axed a program called New Music Australia, which had been a kind of um, anchor point for contemporary classical music in Australia since the late 80s. So six months later, I start at ABC Classic, and uh, my brief was along these lines. Uh, we've decided not to do specialist programming anymore, and we want all of our programmers and presenters to play new Australian music just as part of a mixture of things with everything else they do, and we want you to help make that happen. <laughs> so be an inter internal diplomat in some sense, though with no power or authority. <laughs> and then externally... Um, We've made a lot of people unhappy in the new music community. We, we want you to go out and figure out what we can do <laughs> to <laughs> to appease them. <laughs> Something like that. They didn't even use the word appease, but um, you know, basically, uh, what we can do now, as it were, <laughs> in in this space. So 
the role I've been in ever since then, although it sort of morphed and turned into another role and then became permanent about two and a half years after I started there, I've always felt like a kind of foot in two worlds because obviously I'm there to work for the ABC. The ABC employs me. ABC Classic is, you know, my specific kind of employer or context. And so, you know, I have a job to do for the network. But I've also always felt like an advocate inside the network for the new music world and experimental music world and that that's something that's been very important to me and that's you know had, had its uh, moments where i felt like we've been able to do some really great things and there have been other periods of time where I, i've you know been quite sad about not being able to do <laughs> such great things i mean coming out from that i've always wondered having had conversations with up-and-coming musicians as well as some more experienced musicians why there's a tendency to lump new music together with the experimental arts and why the term experimental itself has become an umbrella term in which the new sits under. Do you mean why do we put all of it under experimental or do you mean why do we put experimental under new music? Under experimental. Okay. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> Neither do I. Uh, in fact, I, I do use the word experimental music more loosely than I used to just because, you know, in the end there is a sense of... Um, kind of vernacular usage and what, how people use it. But I have been in many um, panels over the years where, I mean, I've been in panels trying to, you know, select the winner of the experimental music category at the Art Music Awards and had arguments with people going, ex you know, experimental isn't a style. <laughs> experimental is an activity. It's an approach. It's you actually, it's what you're doing you have to be asking questions. You have to be doing something that is not simply a very accomplished reproduction of what you've done before or somebody else has done before. But I, I'm weakening on that a bit because although I still think that that's true, in inverted commas, it's, if you like, it's a higher order truth. There is, if you like, a cultural truth, which is that experimental music is a style or collection of styles, but it is, I think, quite distinct from what I guess I'd call... Uh, new music as in classical concert music. And there's some overlap. There's a little bit of overlap because some of the practitioners, there's a certain, there's definitely a, a subset of the practitioners that operate in both spheres. Um, and they come together. Why do, why do I talk about them together? I talk about them together because I guess within the house of the ABC and in various other cultural contexts, both of these musics are to some degree marginal and both of them can be seen as being a little bit intellectual, though I don't think it's always their um, their most glorious quality. Um, and therefore, they end up in the same space. Yeah, uh, in terms of advocacy or in terms of opportunity or in terms of some of the people who are engaged with them. Yeah, I've essentially come down to the same conclusions as to why they're often lumped together. And if I talk to anyone who's not from the same kind of sphere or the classical music sphere, it feels highly academic as an experience for an audience member. So balancing this side of your experience with your work with the ABC, which is much more audience oriented and in a very different way than some of these experimental gigs, does audience then become a consideration when you're working on a new piece or when you're programming? I mean, that's interesting. I think one of the things that's helped me to manage cope okay in this job and hopefully do at least a reasonable job at the ABC. Part of my background, I spent um, 15 years teaching English to adult migrants and refugees and sort of did quite a bit of study of cross-cultural communication. I also had a quite a formative experience in my mid-20s living in Istanbul in Turkey and learning um, at least moderate sort of Turkish and teaching English there. And, and I think that a lot of those experiences were quite important to me. Maybe I already thought communication was important. So I think even before I landed at the ABC, I always thought that communication was important. That that doesn't mean that you necessarily ask what people want to hear, but it does mean that you ask, is what I'm doing something that can make sense to the people I'm addressing it to? So that there's greater clarity in how and why you communicate in a way that doesn't totally disengage or alienate some audiences. Yeah. So And part of that is being clear what your audience is. I have no problem whatsoever with people making music that may turn out to be of interest to only five people or 50 people or 300 people. I think it's a very valid thing to do. You can't really put hierarchies of value, I don't think, in this regard, but it, it's, it's a perfectly valid thing to do. What can be a little bit confusing in the new music space and frustrating sometimes looking on at it happening 
is people writing music that's clearly addressed to quite a, um, I'm trying to say, that takes a lot for granted about people's frameworks and previous understanding in order to be able to appreciate it or connect with it or understand what poser or the performers or whatever or the creators are doing. And then those people feel pissed off that it's not going to be played on high rotation radio or it's not going to be played by a symphony orchestra, which kind of has to have an audience of a few thousand people in order to be viable. <laughs> so I think there's a there's a realism thing. I mean, I, I think on the other hand that I think that public institutions that are massively well-funded or at least a lot of cases they're not massively well-funded, but they are relatively well-funded, do still have a responsibility to try and stretch out, if you like, and to find ways of addressing and interacting with and presenting things that go beyond what's um, easy and what, you know, to not only do what always hits the biggest audience target or the, or, you know, is it, so, but it's a complex landscape. And by the same token, creative artists need to be a, a little bit honest, I think, about who it is they're addressing in their music and not to necessarily be pissed off if um, they're not reaching audiences of tens of thousands and not being picked up by certain kinds of opportunities if the music they're writing is so clearly highly specialized and and subculturally narrow requires a very special and not common experience and knowledge base to to get it so it's, i think it, it's a sort of a tension there because i think there is a, a role for people say someone like me i certainly am interested and through something like the new ways podcast and previously new music up late program in those contexts which sort of say well we're doing something ostensibly new and you know what we're doing might be unfamiliar that you're still reaching towards making a diverse range of things that might be challenging and might normally be not accessed by a lot of people trying to find the way in for a wide listenership trying to think laterally about what the musical experience is and how to translate that or how to take something that might be seen as very intellectual or what does it mean in terms of the kind of imagery or spaces or something that it connects with, just finding other ways of um, getting a, a hook into that. So, I mean, it's lazy not to try to do that, but you also need contexts where that is at least partly the invitation for the audience rather than necessarily um, doing a kind of a gotcha thing with them, you know, coming creeping up from behind um, at quarter past six after the news um, in the evening as they're driving home or whatever and, and suddenly hitting them with some sort of barrage of something that they can't decipher readily and don't have a context for. So do you think in terms of radio or bigger live organisations like orchestras that they have to find a way of introducing the audience to a piece? Like the practice in some orchestral or ensemble programming, they use what's called a companion piece method of pairing something new like a commission or programming an unusual piece alongside a standard. I mean, that's certainly one way to do it. I don't think there's any one way to deal with these things. But I guess it is it's it is that thing of thinking about the audience you're addressing. Who are you talking to um, culturally, musically, doing your best to present what you're presenting uh, in a way that gives that listener a way in, that gives them a reasonable chance of um, of enjoying it, of making sense of it, you know? I think that's really important. So in the case of orchestras and programming and things, well, I guess it's up to them because in one sense, in terms of what's going to be better as a financial model, one of the things that orchestras used to do and do far less often these days, it seems, at least in Australia, is have these kind of dedicated new music spaces. So they would put a certain amount of new music into their general programming and then they would create these other events, sometimes in the nature of a mini festival or a sub-series or various things that they do not always the full symphony orchestra it sometimes might be more of like a chamber orchestra subset one of the recent instances of that that didn't run for very long was the sydney symphony carriage work series in sydney something that's run for longer but seems to be perhaps in abeyance now has been the mso metropolis series in melbourne so these kinds of things where you kind of create a separate house that goes okay here you're on a bit more of an adventure <laughs> come with us you trust us we're this big organization uh let us take you on this adventure. And it's certainly true that for many audiences, the festival seems to be an environment where lots of people are willing to take bigger risks and expose themselves to experiences that in the course of their normal uh, diet of general radio listening or attending symphony concerts or whatever it is, they might be less 
less willing to embrace, less willing to invest energy in and, and you know, take a chance with. So that's that's one context. I think I don't think there's any end to the answers of to the question of how you present new work, but I think it is part of the responsibility, certainly of a public organization, of organizations that are publicly funded, to keep thinking about that and to keep engaging with, you know, music, new music that's being made now. Um, where they set the boundaries of that is, I guess, a continual movable feast, which is partly about what's going in the, on in the culture, partly about politics and organizational culture. Uh, does the house of abc classic you know the house of abc classic as it was 25 years ago was it was called abc fm and at that time it included uh radio drama uh poetry readings you know the radio arts i referred to the listening room this kind of sound art for radio if you like M media culture has changed a lot in the last 25 years and it seems to be overwhelmingly the case that um stations or broadcasters or entities of this sort have defined their identity more narrowly and that they've gone from a model of appointment listening where you go well at this point in the week or at this point in the day you can have this experience but over here you can have this other really quite different and not necessarily that related experience to going this is for example ABC classic and when you turn on the radio you will hear something that you immediately recognize as classical music it's a huge cultural change uh, you could sort of talk, think about why that has happened. So one of the questions that comes up a lot in conversation is, why should organisations like orchestras that require a certain amount of security in terms of the audience that they procure, why should they even bother programming things actively to be diverse or new if they can already secure the audience that they have now? Well, at least for the next 50 years, they'll definitely have this audience if they keep playing these classical hits or classical standards. It's a very good question, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I have an opinion about that, but I can't back it up with any studies as such. Uh, just I kind of have, um, if you like, observations that would tend to support it, but I, I can't be sure that I'm right. I think that even the most uh, ostensibly conservative audiences need stretch experiences in order to re refresh or keep alive their heartland or their, you know, their preferred content. So in other words, uh, to go to the symphony orchestras, if they really were to program more and more narrowly towards the repertoire that they know that 90, upwards of 90% of their audience loves and to only program that repertoire all of the time, there is a kind of law of diminishing returns where the the beauty and pleasure of that music just start to recede a little bit. It's like the whole thing is just not quite so alive. To know you're alive, you have to occasionally, I could put this, this is kind of maybe a bit silly, but to know you're alive, you have to occasionally experience pain or at least discomfort. <laughs> um, <laughs> like a shock to the system, you mean? Yes, yeah, something that, um, sharpen, that sharpens your awareness of what you're hearing. And that if you're only hearing what you expect to hear, then your your mind and your senses become dulled in some sense. That's a possible argument. <laughs> I think there are there are other arguments, like saying that well, an art form that has no living practitioners in the sense of creating new work, how long will a society agree to um, fund something that's like that? Uh, is there a tipping point where people say this has nothing to do with us? So that's another a possible thing. For our first musical intermission is some brand new Australian music. What you're listening to is an excerpt from Stephen's most recent album release, Sunset Inside the Listening Room, from the track Dayside. You might even catch Stephen on flute in this excerpt.
So how about we take a look at how programming works for radio and the statistics in terms of the changing demographic for the ABC, because you get quite a good picture in terms of who's listening to classical music. Something interesting about ABC Classic in the last while, fixed into programming policy, uh, we're currently running at around about a million listeners a week, which is to say that there are a million people in Australia who tune into ABC Classic every week. Some of them are listening virtually all the time, or at least every day, and some of them are maybe just tuning in once or twice a week, but there are a million people who tune in every week. Okay, that's actually a rather good figure, and it's up somewhat over the last two, three years. Contrary to what many people expected about radio in the internet era, at this moment in time at least, uh, the audience figures are going up. We are on a lot more platforms than we used to be, so we're accessible through a lot of those digital channels. But it's interesting that, that the overall listening figures are up. During the last five years, we've also had a much more focused policy of increasing the amount of Australian composition on the network, increasing the amount of music by women on the network, and more recently, increasing the amount of music by First Nations composers on the network. I mean, there's always been a desire to include Australian music. That's always been a target in a broad sense for the network, and that, but that's gone a bit up and down over the 16 years I've been there. But in the last five years, it's gone up from 9% to 15% Australian, 15.2 actually in the last financial year. That's measured in minutes, not in pieces. So it is literally the amount of airtime of music airtime taken up by Australian composers has, is above 15%. In that same period of time, we've gone from the you know shockingly low two-point-something women composers back in 2015. I think it was 2.8, but it was under 3% at any rate. We're now at 12% for the last financial year. So that's grown a lot, and that's been a focused policy of both recording more music by women, seeking out recordings, and encouraging partners partner organizations when they come to us with proposals and things to include women composers in their programming. So there's a kind of few different things pushing there. And obviously, there are other people out in the world doing that as well. So there are a lot more recordings than there were five years ago. From a lot of the traditional repertoire, particularly, people have been digging up a lot of, you know, Baroque and classical and romantic and early 20th century women composers who existed, most of whom, apart from a hand, most of us not really aware of. New Music Up Late had a policy of commissioning towards increasing the amount of women composers on the program. We never reached 50%, but in New Music that should have been possible and we were getting closer. But I think in classical music as a whole, 50% is extremely aspirational and I don't know when that would happen because we're dealing with the huge cultural imbalance um, in the access and support for women composers historically, and because so much of what we play is historical still, it's going to be a slow process. But we're at 12%. We intend to keep growing it. During that time, and we've also gone from almost no Indigenous or First Nations composers. I mean, you, if you went five years back, I could name two First Nations composers whose music had appeared on the station, William Barton and Deborah Cheatham. The body of work that was available from either of those composers was relatively small, especially from Deborah. She was really emerging from being known primarily as a, a performer to kind of growing into her composer voice, and that's grown enormously in the last while. But the other thing that's happened in the last while is that there have been various initiatives and individuals coming out of the woodwork, and there are now a lot more First Nations composers, and we've been keen to partner with organisations that are doing stuff in that space. To roll back a bit, we've gone from a you know devastatingly small um, percentage of First Nations composition to 0.5%. We've reached 0.5%. Um, it's, it's terrible, but it's, it's an achievement nonetheless in terms of where we come from. Um, and we continue. We keep working on that. In that time, our audience has gone up. Do you think it's related to these changes in programming in the last few years? I don't know if it's related. I think there are other factors at play, but it might be helping and it's certainly not hurting because it is part of this sense that what you're hearing on the radio is a little bit more reflecting the world that you live in. I used to, when I was still in high school, go to ABC Classic FM and that was how I would find new repertoire, especially music I hadn't heard of before. Because searching for it myself, especially as a teenager, I had no idea how to start, where to start. And if I were to just search up piano repertoire, you would just find a lot of Chopin and Bach and Rachmaninoff. 
And then there was a lot of Australian music being played on the airwaves, and it was often how I would discover and expand my own repertoire. I'm very glad that it's expanding in this way now, because I do think that there will probably be be other musicians who will be doing the same thing that I was. That's it. If you actually, if you're hearing that music as part of your normal diet, and this is one of the things we've been trying to do in a sense, is put more of that music into rotation, into kind of spaces where it gets heard, you know, more than once. It doesn't just get played once and then forgotten, which has been one of the terrible things that's happened with a lot of contemporary classical music culture over the years. Yeah, and trying to get, get the listeners more familiar with more composers, living composers, and having a connection, you know, being able to think of a piece or a couple of pieces that they uh, have an association with, that, that they feel something about. Well, the ideal would be I would like to see classical music move beyond kind of in the last 50 years where it's shifted to this nostalgic experience of really big or recognisable pieces that we all may have memories of from the past. It would be nice if we came back and could actively engage with more new music, especially now, for example, in Australia, we have such a diverse audience because we are so multicultural a country and therefore we have talented and diverse practitioners. It would be really vibrant and living to be able to pull this thing together. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the diversity thing. Obviously, uh, gender is one paradigm of diversity. The First Nations one is another significant one. But we are a very multicultural society. We hear some voices from non-English speaking backgrounds on the network. And we hear music by some composers from a variety of other backgrounds. But it's interesting. I guess what we're still hearing is very much Western classical music through a particular lens. So I'm not sure, but maybe that's something that might change in the next while. It's certainly something we've started talking about. Well, this is also something I've been thinking about, and maybe it relates to the word classical itself. Well, firstly, I need to acknowledge uh, that the world of classical music we're talking about is one that is Western, so I'm not in any way advocating for us to erase Bach or Beethoven or Brahms, because that is the history of this art form. However, now that we're moving into this century, we can start to think about the word classical itself. Because we're so multicultural a society, we no longer need to apply it just to Western traditions. We have the luxury of accessing and hearing Indian classical traditions, Chinese classical traditions, First Nations classical traditions. So if we move to being able to encompass all of these other traditions under the umbrella term of what is generically considered classical, there may be some ways in which to collaborate uh, or for wider representation on the stage or in concert halls. Yeah. It's hard to know what's going to happen on the concert hall. That's an interesting one because I guess... uh just the fact of an institution such as an orchestra being an orchestra and being defined in a certain way, will they play music from different musical traditions? I mean, there's a certain amount of that happening, of course, in the UK uh, with some of the English orchestras, particularly in relation to South Asian musicians, to you know, musicians of Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi background. So I, I think some of that kind of collaborations probably could become more common. But Will it become a sort of fused new thing? I don't know. Well, the issue will arise that there is some level of danger of it all becoming false representation or tokenistic if we just smash everything together, especially at the beginning. So I think it will take a long time. So you're right in that collaboration will be a more likely route so that those working from different backgrounds and traditions and artists who have different stories to tell from one another will be able to work on a more even platform to then inform what is being represented on stage. Yeah, I, so I think the question that comes to my mind is the orchestra, when we talk about the orchestra in a context like Australia, what we're talking about is a Western, a European style orchestra. The question in my mind is not so much should symphony orchestras play music that isn't Western classical music, um, I mean, I think they should play music by people from everywhere, but should they play music that's not written for symphony orchestras? Probably not. Um, so I guess the question is a little bit more how the society makes space for other kinds of um, ensembles or traditions for, for them to have some kind of um, cultural presence and potentially institutional support how that all evolves so there's sort of two different strands isn't there there's one one thing is people from lots of different cultural traditions having the opportunity to play in the symphony orchestra space and bring some kind of voice to that that might be fresh or informed by other other musical traditions and the other is you know musicians of whatever other traditions 
being able to do the music that they do in their own terms with the instruments that as, as it's developed in those cultural contexts. And I suppose they're, they're kind of two different things, aren't they? I mean, what, what's your sense about all of this? Because, I mean, you've, you come, you yourself have a non-English speaking background broadly, though obviously you're someone who's a fluent English speaker, but what, what does that other cultural background mean to you and how does that intersect with all of this classical music stuff? So I suppose I have a bit of a long answer for this. The first thing I learned ever was the piano and I was four years old when the rigorous piano lessons started. So that was my first way into music, which was, of course, through the Western tradition. And I've always been trained in the Western tradition for music, inclusive of composition. So when, in fact, I entered the Sydney Conservatorium back in 2014, I tried almost actively not to do things that may have been labelled as Asian, because although I did have an awareness of my culture, I didn't want to be pigeonholed, at least artistically pigeonholed, as the Vietnamese composer who writes Vietnamese music and tells Vietnamese stories in a Vietnamese way. So I just kept training in the Western tradition, all to the point where I ended up at possibly the most traditionally renowned institution by getting private lessons with a composer named Thierry Esquèche through the Conservatoire National Supérieur de Musique et de Danse in Paris. And I ended up studying there, and it was actually there, in fact, that I was actively encouraged to engage with my own cultural knowledge and traditions, not because it was tokenistic, but because there was intrigue in terms of the different kinds of stories I could tell or different things I could bring musically and artistically to the table. And part of that experience lined up with the fact that there are parts in Paris, which is very different from Australia in terms of concert music and programming, where they were purposefully programming a lot of music from different cultures deriving from their own cultural traditions. So, for example, if I went to the Philharmonie de Paris or the Cité de la Musique, they would have had a Persian group playing all of their traditional music on stage or new music from their community on stage. And then it would have been followed by a separate concert, almost immediately afterwards, by the Orchestre de Paris on the main stage, playing Stravinsky or Debussy. So to me, they had found a way to represent diversity, not through the same traditions, but to understand that this space or the venue of the Philharmonie, which is, quite frankly, seemingly built for classical music, could house other forms of classical music. So perhaps I'm being a bit idealistic, but I would be really interested in seeing not the same model, but a similar approach to how the concert hall or the stage can be used for this level of diverse storytelling. So that's, I guess, more about, so it's not so much about symphony orchestras making space, but it's about venues like, you know, Hamer Hall or the Sydney Opera House Concert Hall or the Perth Concert Hall or these kinds of, these sort of spaces um, and the ways that they're curated and, and produce produce events that they um, seek out or at least are open to and responsive to these other traditions in their concert programming. Well, the Sydney Opera House has the word opera in it, but at the end of the day, architecture can house different experiences if they choose to. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, I think a certain amount of that is happening, but it probably, it's not clear to me that, I wonder what might be different to both the French and in a different way the UK context. It doesn't feel like there's a critical mass around non-Western classical music traditions in Australia in terms of um, groups that have managed to coalesce to create a strong ongoing ensemble that has a bit of visibility outside a community. I mean, interestingly, of course, the Sydney Con for the last while has actually been has its Chinese music ensemble and has actually been kind of working somewhat steadily in that way. And, and some people studying composition have written for the Chinese music ensemble. It's like there are seeds of things that might lead to to that. The closest thing I can think of in that regard, actually the obvious one actually is Taikos. Yeah, and then they've also worked closely with bigger or more notable organisations like the Sydney Symphony Orchestra to premiere new music. Yeah, and they have certainly crossed over to quite a broad audience, bringing that particular Japanese tradition and inflecting it with some significant amounts of Australian content as well, I mean Australian composition within that frame. Is that then to say that organisations like orchestras, which are frankly embedded in the public's imagination of what the essence or ultimate vision of classical music is, is that then their responsibility to start reaching out and collaborating with different people and more diverse practitioners in order to represent new things on stage? And it sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> is, is it their responsibility? It's a really interesting question, isn't it? I mean, 
it re- I guess it keeps coming back to what does the society think we should be getting with the public money that we're spending in those spaces? What are we looking for as a society? In what ways do we represent the society as a whole with what have been seen as and are to some extent elite art forms? So they sort of come and go in their accessibility. I, I feel sad that you know we don't have any equivalent of the proms in Australia. We used to, funnily enough. Really? Oh, yeah. The um, Sydney Symphony used to have prom concerts in the town hall back in the um, 60s and 70s. And it was more adventurous programming. And it was that whole thing, too, of, you know, people, there were things like cushion concerts and stuff like that, and just very, just mixing it up a lot in different ways about the way in which people would hear an orchestral concert and what kinds of things might happen in it. I mean, it was mixing it up within the context of where the society was at in the 60s and 70s. So it's different to what would happen now if we had something like that. I think if we did that now, we would be hearing maybe from more diverse cultural voices than they heard from then. Hmm. I wonder why that model stopped. Yeah. Why is that not a thing now, I wonder? It's certainly something that connected really strongly with younger audiences, that kind of informality, and I think a more affordable ticket price model as well somehow. Oh, yes, that's that's definitely helpful, having affordable ticket prices. In fact, what you briefly mentioned before with SSO's Carriage Work series, when there was a lot of new music being programmed as part of that, I remember going to those concerts and looking around me and seeing a noticeably younger audience and also a more diverse audience. And maybe that's partly associated with the venue being carriage works and the ticket price being at $35 as opposed to $120. So it brought in a younger audience, but you also got to see and sometimes meet the composers afterwards and they're living, breathing people. Seeing the industry in a way that reflects the fact that it's a living organism, I think it really inspired a lot of people. Maybe I'm too idealistic, but I did see a lot of people under 30, myself included. Absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously, it's not as big a space to fill audience-wise as, as the um, Sydney Opera House Concert Hall, but they were packed, those concerts. Uh, I suspect they could have filled a larger space than they did fill. Yeah, it certainly seemed to be embraced by you know probably a smaller part of the society than than the main stage concerts, but quite a large number nonetheless and as you say it's a different group of people and it's really interesting and you would think that's one of the things that symphony orchestras need to do is um, connect with a more diverse audience for our second intermission here's another excerpt from steven's new album sunset inside the listening room this time from the track nightside
Yes. So thinking of into the long term about how to sustain this industry with its generally and statistically speaking, its older audience. I mean, if you want to keep listening to Bach, then we need to find a way in which the entire industry will live longer than, to some people, it seems to be declining. But it requires nitty gritty conversations about programming, audiences and new or different storytelling, despite the industry's legacy of this seemingly continually dying state. Will it be able to last? I, th I think it probably will last partly because this is one of the things we haven't touched on yet, but of course classical music is a very significant underpinning of quite large amounts of music in the areas of film and also gaming. You know, there's quite a large part of the population who don't necessarily think of themselves as being interested in classical music and don't think about the music as being classical or not classical, but nonetheless have, you know, favourite film scores and favourite games where the music is actually classical in either a more nostalgic or a more sort of contemporarily updated kind of way, the language. I mean, orchestras have had stabs at this, and it's hard to know whether the way they've gone about this so far is a, is a good thing or not. They've, you know, we've seen these concerts of game game music and, you know, whole film scores being <laughs> played, <laughs> you know, The Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, and all eight Harry Potter films. All eight. <laughs> yeah, terrifying. <laughs> um <laughs> And I mean, it doesn't thrill me, but uh, I don't think they need to thrill me <laughs> with everything they're doing. And it seemed to thrill quite a lot of people. Actually, in that light, I should mention, I had an, ex an amazing experience in, in Vienna. I went to Vienna for the first time in my life just uh, six months ago. Wow, pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah, I went to four concerts in four very different contexts over those four days. But one of the concerts I went to was to go and hear the Vienna Philharmonic. And the only concert available to hear them during the four days I was there was John Williams conducting the film scores of John Williams with the Vienna Philharmonic. So Anne Sophie Mutter as the um, violin soloist with all these special things written for her by John Williams and John Williams conducting. They sold out, I think, three or four concerts of the same program at the Vienna Philharmonic, which is, you know, a big venue. And it was a relatively young audience. And the audience was absolutely ecstatic. There were also there were kids in the quite a few family groups in the audience, and a lot of younger adults, uh, maybe maybe some teenagers. I'm not sure about that. I think, and yeah, they were so excited, and there was so much enthusiasm from the audience. And I, I actually left during the fifth encore because we had a a late lunch date. This was a morning concert, 11 a.m. I mean, in Vienna, the music starts at nine. Classical music starts at nine in the morning. There is stuff happening somewhere. And it just goes through the day, you know. It's a different world in that sense. Uh, so yeah, I left during the fifth encore, but and I don't know how many encores there were, but they just kept playing new things. And the so it's it's interesting. You know, where is new classical music? What is contemporary classical music? I guess um, it's a lot of different things, and we probably shouldn't forget that because that's actually the new classical music that can, is connecting with the largest number of listeners by far as there should be many listeners. And it's true that orchestras are now more actively programming in film music or music that is often integrated with other media. I think from memory, the ABC has done something similar. I remember turning on the ABC Classic and there was some film music on the waves. Is that a dedicated hour? It's a dedicated hour. And then there's an occasional sprinkling of tracks in other contexts, say in drive in the evening. But there's an hour a week that's yeah dedicated film music with someone presenting it who is you know an expert in that area and passionate about it. Likewise, there's now a dedicated hour of game music <clears throat> on the network. Yeah, presented by Guy Mina Shamali from Melbourne, who is himself also a game music composer. So we're gradually, gradually opening that door, I guess. And I think that's having a little bit of an effect on the general programming, because I guess in both of those spaces. You hear something which is clearly classical music or classical-like, but there's also certain kinds of studio aesthetics involved. And the aesthetic of a studio-produced sound as opposed to a classic concert hall recording sound is a bit different. And so making that a little bit more part of the network is also part of things becoming a bit more contemporary in the sorts of sounds that people expect. Also, it's very cool to see John Williams, a living composer, alive and conducting his own work. It was it was amazing. You know, I, I to my shame, it's not a concert I would have raced to choose to see. 
I saw it because it was the one that I could see. But it was a fantastic experience, actually. It was, you know, and the sense of that audience engagement. That, and, of course, the Vienna Philharmonica, you know, one of the world's great orchestras. And John Williams is a huge um, fan of the French horn. And boy, boy, do they have French horn players. And there were eight French horn players on stage, and they used all of them. And my goodness. And you could see in the orchestrations, there were sort of situations where all the French horn players are playing, sometimes all together in unison, sometimes in you know four or five di four different parts or whatever. And then there are bits where he uses just two horns or three or five, and you hear the, the weight and color of those uses of the French horn, which is clearly one of his signature instruments. <laughs> and um, Yeah, the French horn seems to be extremely popular and the signature instrument of a lot of more widely recognizable composers for screen. In fact, I think there was an interview with Hans Zimmer where he was talking about writing some music, I think for the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, where he mentioned scoring for this seemingly ridiculous amount of 12 horns. But all of this, perhaps this is probably adding into how you mentioned this change in sound, both in orchestration and how recordings are now produced. Yeah, because if there's that kind of fatter, kind of rounder sound of brass instruments being really important in the orchestra, I guess if we think about where the orchestras come from, you go back to the classical orchestra and it's essentially what we'd now call a chamber orchestra of string players with a small number of other instruments included. You know, there's a timpani player, there's a small number of woodwinds, and there's the French horns. That's it. Occasional appearances from trumpets in, you know, Baroque or classical scores. So it just kept moving. And of course, percussion has exploded. I mean, that's one of the defining things that happened in the last hundred years is that percussion exploded in classical music from being a fairly small part of the scores of even people like Wagner and so on into being a massive part of the scores of any number of 20th century composers. So if we're now going to cover this idea of the historical experience of music or historical experience of programming, say in Bach's time, where he was producing a new cantata a week, I mean, of course, he was using little reused segments here and there, but the premise was a new work to confront his audience with on a weekly basis. It was all new music at the time, and that was a constant experience. So now we're still playing that new music, but it's the new music from the 16th and 17th century. The question I have is that within the last century, why did we make this substantial cultural shift in the genre of classical music to have such a strong historical focus on the music that we now produce and continually perform? Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I think the answer is... Um is reasonably clear in a way, it's it's recordings. I mean, two things happen. I think two things happen. Recordings happen and kind of modernism happens. And maybe they happen together and maybe they are to some degree related because suddenly people have access to, you know, this whole tradition and don't just have to go on a special occasion and, you know, with a large group of people and spending money to hear this music. And you get this whole development through the 19th century that just really comes to its peak in the first half of the 20th century of historical consciousness and the sort of way of seeing seeing human culture and human society as being on this progress arc, this idea of, um, you know, which informs the Hegelian thing, which informs Marxism, but informs also a lot of capital, thinking about capitalism and a lot of the ideology of the last sort of 150, 200 years is underpinned by this idea that human history is this unfolding story of development and achievement and discovery and progress. And it's in that context that we then get both a much greater interest in the historical, which up until then really wasn't something people thought about that much. You know, people weren't that interested to hear the music of Bach, you know, 50 years after he was dead. They weren't that interested. And then, you know, Mendelssohn and a few other people in the German romantics decided that he was a thing. Shakespeare kind of largely dropped out of the picture. And he was kind of recovered by the German romantics in the first case and then taken up in, in England and elsewhere. That, that romanticism, in a way, comes hand in hand then with nostalgia. So you have the rise of nostalgia and the idea that modernity is both exciting and is progress but is also threatening and is destroying what we love. You know, you, you get the dark satanic mills of, um, you know, what's his name, the 
famous, um, one of the many famous English poets of the 19th century writing about the dark satanic mills. I hate it when I forget things like that. Um, Keith Emerson? No, I didn't think so. He, he's fairly important as well. Oh, William Blake, William Blake. Yeah, William Blake, that's right. But Emerson is really important in that as well. I mean, the New England transcendentalists are also part of this. How so? They're both leaning forward and producing something new, but they're also dwelling in a kind of nostalgia already, this sense of that we are losing various notions of community and of the natural world and of suddenly creating the, all these ideas of things that are threatened by technological development, by the growth of cities, by all of these things. I mean, they're kind of contemporary myths in a way because, you know, human history has always been full of development and change and the natural and the technological aren't really separate. But we create this mythos and then there is this emotional attachment to the past. And then you get the recording and then you get the recording. So those two things happening together, you know, and suddenly all of the past is accessible. And so through the recording, we also become used to listening to music we know rather than music that we don't know. In specifically just the classical music sphere? Because if we look at jazz or pop music, there seems to be a yearning for the new or new records. I think it happens across music. But the thing about pop music is that um, pop music also connects in with dance and youth culture and emerging youth cultures. So that drives its movement forward and it's, um, it's the audience for new stuff. But still, each generation gets stuck overwhelmingly with the pop music of their youth and keeps listening to it. That's true. And then they call it the classics. That's right. For me, listening to pop music as a teenager, anything that happened before the late 60s didn't exist for me. You know, absolutely. So if something like Elvis Presley, I thought it would be, why would anyone listen to stuff like that, for God's sake? You know, even the early Beatles seemed completely uninteresting. And the, the whole world of pop music that I was interested in, or rock music or, you know, whatever, was basically started around the time of psychedelia and um, prog rock and all of that kind of, and, you know, electric blues, heavy metal, that kind of explosion of that kind of stuff, and then continued into punk and post-punk and, and, the, and the disco era and, you know, and electronica and all of that stuff. Things that were before that didn't exist. That's not the case for my kids. And it's not because they're particularly nostalgic or reactionary. It's just that the reference points are so much broader now. It's just changed. So the now is always in the context of a huge then, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So this latent romanticism, if I can call it that, has perpetuated our idea of what a classical experience is in relation to ourselves and how we then associate with an image of the past as being in some ways an ideal one. Do you think that this relates to our experiences outside of classical music, but our experiences with our environment? I think one of the huge discoveries of the last few years has, in Australia has been this revelation that the natural world of Australia that the British um, invaders, explorers, colonists, whatever you want to call them, um, saw was the natural world as created by the way that First Nations people treated that environment. So, in fact, it wasn't some sort of, um, it wasn't some pre-human or non-human landscape. It was a landscape that was already heavily shaped by human cultural activity and agricultural activity. And so it's one of the weird things that when we talk about this nostalgia thing, it's fascinating that we have national parks. I'm very glad that we do have national parks, by the way. I'm not at all interested in arguing against them. But at the same time, there's something slightly strange and arcane and very modern about a national park. Because ideally what would happen is we just we'd live in the landscape and we'd take care of it. But what we do instead is trash large parts of it and then section off bits and say, you can't really do anything with this. Just leave it alone. Leave it alone. This is nature. And the natural world that we inherited when we came in from my ancestors, uh, came from Europe and invaded this place, the natural environment that we inherited was something that had been shaped by human activity for thousands and thousands of years. 
it wasn't, you know, the, the parkland, the beautiful parkland that they walked into in the um, plains of Sydney, of Western Sydney, that didn't happen through no humans not doing anything. That happened through humans doing all of these patterns of seasonal burning and um, harvesting. And so there is a delusion there about the thing that we're going to lose because the thing that we're going to lose never existed. Yes, exactly. You know, I, I think we could probably talk about this for hours. Uh, so this is probably a really poignant place to bring our chat to a close. Firstly, I just want to say thank you so much for all of your time and your insight into this enormous range of fascinating topics. Thank you. I enjoyed myself. I wasn't too self-indulgent. <laughs> <Dunno>. <laughs> no, not at all. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, so thank you so much again for being on the podcast. Uh, to the audience right now listening to your voice, it's I'm sure it's been a treat, especially for us to investigate the world of radio, programming, the new music scene, audiences, and all the way to this little chat about the power of nostalgia. For everyone listening, details about Stephen and his work, including his own podcast, The New Waves, are available in the description, and you can go and purchase Stephen's album, Sunset Inside the Listening Room, as a digital album or on vinyl through Bandcamp. Do check out his music and his work, and I'll catch you all next time. <laughs>